a lot of people say, why didn't you continue with your father's uh, career as a painter? My answer to them is very simple. I'm also a painter. The only difference is that my father's painting is only a few square meters in size. My painting is a few thousand kilometers in size. That's the only difference. Singapore, when the British left us, say in 1960, three out of four people lived in squatter areas. You probably don't even know what is a squatter area, but in those days, it's just all over town. So the government of Singapore decided that we, if we want to have a sustainable city, uh, compatible with all the other larger countries, we must achieve excellence. And one of the signs of removing backwardness is to remove the squatters and house everybody in housing. And to do so, since the people in those days were very poor, we then introduced public housing to build subsidized housing, good quality housing, but subsidized with affordable rental and affordable selling price. That is a very important key to the transformation of Singapore. So within 25 years, between 1960 and 1985, we actually got rid of all the squatters. We housed every Singaporean into public housing, as well as, of course, private housing. So that transformation is very thorough, very impressive. Yeah, that's a remarkable story of Singapore. If you want to plan a city, the first thing to ask, how many people are we planning for? In 1991, when we planned the city, I proposed to plan for 100 years to 2091. But nowadays, when I plan for other cities, I su suggest that we plan up to 2070. Because beyond that, really, the whole world may have to control population growth. So it's like planning for the ultimate population size. Because every city wants the city to be unique. So for Singapore and for cities I plan, I look for the design gene of that locality to give it its unique character. Now, what are the key design genes? You see, different locality has different characteristics. For example, they have different climates. The climates also affect planning and design. And they also have different customs. And that also affects what you put into the city plan or to the design. And also some kind of uh, architectural heritage. For example, in Southeast Asia, because of the strong sun, we never have uh, very strong colors. If you look at the Malay villages, the colors are kind of pastel color. Why? Because if you paint very strong colors on the Malay village buildings, after a few years, under the hot sun, they all turn into pastel color. And second is heritage. As I mentioned earlier, every city has its own locality conditions. So even though in Singapore we have shop houses, but our shop house design and the shop house design in Malacca, in Hong Kong, they're different because of the local influence. So we must protect the, our own heritage. They are very, very unique. And the third thing, which very, very few people talk about, is density. So, as I mentioned earlier, the large city, we must have a higher density and make the design more grand. Small city, we have low density, make design more romantic. So, so if we pick the right density for the cities of different sizes, when you arrive at the city, we're not even looking at the buildings. You already know you're going into a different kind of cities. I told myself that despite the high density building, high density city that we plan, we should not use high density as an excuse for not creating a good environment. So I told myself, how can I live with high density uh, policy and yet create a nice urban environment. It dawned on me that you can 
have a high density city with a nice environment by using the Western chessboard idea. Because in the Western chessboard, you have the black square and white square alternating. So if we put the high buildings in the black squares, then the white square we put the parks or schools or uh, uh, low-rise shopping centers and so on. So in that case, if you can disperse the high density building with the lower density development, you don't feel the oppressiveness of high density. So in the new town, I planned it this way. And later when I planned Singapore, the whole city, I also alternated. For example, some of the historical area is naturally low density. And uh, not far from the historical area like Shenton Way, we allow high density. But when you're in Shenton Way, you don't feel oppressive because if you just turn your head around, you see the sky. And that's how Singapore was planned. You don't actually go through miles and miles of high-rise building. You go a few miles, one or two miles, then you go to a medium density, you go to a low density, and you go to higher density again. So that creates a variety of environment and actually makes the city a better city. I realize is that we should not treat a city as one body. We must treat a city as a family. In a family, you have grandparents, Below that, you have several parents. And b below the parents, each parent, you have several children. So in a city, like in Singapore, I divided the city. Below that, I divided into regions. Each region would have a population size of around a million people. And below the region, I divided them into new towns. Each new town would have a population size of around 150 to 200,000 occasionally up to 300,000 people. And below the new town, we have neighborhoods. Below the neighborhoods, we have precincts. That's how Singapore was planned. You see, if you take a city like Singapore, the, if we take, uh, for example, the commercial center, the, city, the, the highest level of commercial center is CBD in, in the central part of Singapore. But in the region, I have regional centers. It's a one rank below the CBD. And below the region, we have town centers in new towns. It's one rank below the regional center. In other words, and below the town center, I have neighborhood centers. So if I live in a neighborhood, I want to buy a piece of soap. I don't have to go to CBD. I just walk to the neighborhood center. I can get it. But if I want to have a uh, a kind of maybe a special dress, I may have to go to town center and get it. So we actually cascade them uh, in ranking. And in a similar way, in a, in a city, I would plan for hospitals in different regions, uh, universities in different regions. But below that, in new towns, I will plan for polytechnic. Below that, in neighborhoods, I will plan for high school, primary school. So we cascade the functions, facilities, and amenities according to the different family members. In other words, uh, if you are a grandfather, you are very mature, you take care of the big issues. But when you are a father, you are still mature, but you cannot take care of as many things as your grandfather. But if you are a son, you, can, you are not depend, independent. You depend on your father and grandfather. You can take care of only certain limited things. So it's like a, that's how a city should function. You see, if we don't subdivide a city into this kind of manner, and we treat the city as one city, the problem is that it's like putting the weight of five or six people onto one person. Now, what kind of person is he? He, is, he, he cannot function, he can't move. You know, that's what I mean by traffic jam. I'm quite worried about the fact that in today's world, when things are changing very fast, 
people say, well, we should not really plan the city long term because things are changing very fast. What you plan today may be different tomorrow. So you should just plan short term. I totally cannot accept that because a city is made up of concrete and steel. It's long term. You cannot say, oh, I built a 50-story building today and I accept that five years later I'll pull down for changed circumstances. It's not possible. But on the other hand, you can ask, how can we, can, can we be sure that whatever we built will last a long time? My answer is that if you spend time studying the basic human needs of a city and also understanding the basic need of the land for the city. If you spend time studying that and find out the answer and you plan accordingly, then the city should be able to last for a long time. I just feel that there's too much noise nowadays to say that the world is changing so fast and therefore we have to be, we have to go with the change. And also there's kind of believe that the more sexy, sexy looking the city, in other words, if the plan is uh, have a crazy looking road layout, crazy looking uh, buildings, that would actually uh, become creative. I don't go for that because if you live in a city, what you want is calmness, legibility, uh, a kind of, uh, I would say, a sense of community predictability, and uh, we should never turn a city into a theme park. In other words, despite the fact that we must be very disciplined and create calmness, tranquility, and so on, but we still have to create a city that is enjoyable to live in, so it's fun. Now, once you know what creates fun for the people, then you identify the functions to serve the fun. Fun would mean including education, uh, cultural activities, and so on. So then you identify the functions. And once you identify the functions, then you create a city form to satisfy the function. Form follows function follows fun. is the guideline for me in city planning. And we must give them housing. We must give them commercial centers so that they create jobs. We must give them industry and also uh, schools, hospitals, and uh, even uh, police stations and uh, fire stations, and uh, sports complex, because we want the city people to be able to, to, to lead a healthy life, and also uh, parks. So even a small, simple thing like parks, we have parks at the city level. Between, in the region, we have regional parks. New town, we have town parks. Neighborhood, we have neighborhood parks. And uh, precinct, we have precinct parks. So, and the location of the parks, the sizes of each type of park was also studied and uh, kind of calibrated. And that's how Singapore is seen as a kind of garden city, eh? something to do with that. All these things were identified as basic human needs and incorporated in the in the plan, to plan a city well, I said you just have to remember three things. To have the humanist's heart, a scientist's head, and an artist's eyes. Humanist heart, in the sense that you have to plan for people and land. You have to create a plan where people who live inside find the city livable, and also the society resilient. Land, you want to design a city where the, the land is highly functional and also ecologically highly sustainable. Now, the scientist's head is that, to my mind, a city is like a machine for living. Now, to design a machine, you must know all the machine parts, the sizes of each part, the number of the parts that you need put, put together and put them at the right places. So it is a very precise science. It's not something you just draw according to your fancy. But uh, to put this machine 
onto the land. We have to massage the machine so that when the machine is put on the land, it would complement nicely with the land and will not destroy the land. And to help you understand that, so you need to have an artist's eyes to romance with the land. That's uh, how I always keep in my mind when I plan a city.